gonna sing a new song Child on the
exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him, He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name.
days of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no to redeem lives is powerful to transform lives and father god this morning we come to you through his name the greatest mercy that you could have shown us has been the death and the resurrection and transformation of our lives through jesus christ and we celebrate that this morning as your people as we open up our lips of praise to you we also open up your word this morning to read and study from it so that we may hear from you. Would you speak now that we, your servants, your people here present this morning are listening? Would you help us to not only be just hearers of the word, but doers? Would you help us through the power of your Holy Spirit? We ask this morning in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit and God's people said, you may be seated. Welcome. We're glad you're here. For those who are here in, in person and those online, uh, we, we, on behalf of the pastoral team, we're glad that you're here. And as we continue this series on the book of Zephaniah, uh, more than halfway through the book now. And so next week, we'll be wrapping up this series. Uh, and I hope that you have been challenged by this book. If you've never studied this book, it uh, may give you some... Uh, some guidance as to go deeper into this study of this fascinating little book of prophecy of Zephaniah. Um, mercy. Mercy. How many times have you pondered in the meaning and the implications of this word, mercy? Mercy is the compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone within one's power to punish or harm, or an event to be grateful for, especially because its occurrence prevents something unpleasant or provides some kind of relief from suffering. I think most of us here in this room would say that God is merciful. But how many times would you say God has mercied you? How many times has God mercied you? 
His mercies never come to an end. The scripture teaches us that, and particularly this morning as we go through Sephaniah, we'll learn that from the text explicitly. And we know that they are new every morning. And the word used for new in the Hebrew, the word hadas, literally means never experienced before. Never experienced before. That's what it means, new, in the Hebrew. In other words, today's mercy is different from yesterday or the day before that or the day even before that and the day before before that. Because it literally means you never experience it, so it never ceases to be new. Just as the seasonal flu vaccine changes from year to year, and you have to get it every year, it's a new strain of mercy each day. Why, you might ask? Well, simply because you didn't sin today the way you did yesterday, and the day before yesterday, and the day before that yesterday. I want you to try this little exercise with me this morning. Figure out how old you are. Now, don't tell me how old you are. I don't I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I want you to think through and figure out how old you are, but not in years, but in days. So for me, today, I am 11,690 days old today. I don't want you to take the sum and figure out my age because then I'll be embarrassed. But that's the sum of total of different kinds of mercy I've received from life to date. 11,699 mercies. I wonder what would be your number of mercies that you have received up to date. By the time you're 21, if you're not 21 yet, you'll get there one day soon enough, and then you'll wish you were younger. But by the time you're 21, you will have experienced 7,665 unique mercies in your life, at least, at least if you count it one per day. When you hit midlife, for those who are right there in the middle, right, your numbers will look like approximately 14,600 mercies. And then for those who are here who are more wise and older than us, by the time you hit retirement, God has mercied you at least 23,725 times. Can you believe that? That's a lot of mercy, right? (laughs) Amen to that. As you think of that this morning, that begs the question and really puts the the framework to think how you personally have experienced the mercy of God. We may live our lives and not really be aware of that much mercy in our lives. And though you will experience many mercies throughout our lives, I wonder how many regrets you will also rack up. Regret, you see, is the being or feeling sad, repentant, or disappointed over something that has happened or you've done before, especially a loss or a missed opportunity. And we could count those as well, and I'm not going to make you do that this morning, but at least I, I bring this to mind as you compare both, because these Two things, these regrets and mercies, make a profound impact in our lives and how we live our day to day in light of eternity. And I can assure you from God's perspective, He doesn't want you to live life with many regrets. On the contrary, He wants you to live a life with many mercies that you rack up those mercies in your life and that you share and give glory to God and share with others the testimony of God's faithfulness into your life. But pretending that life cannot or doesn't have regrets 
It's like trying to cover up the sun with our thumb. And there is an antidote to that. The scripture teaches us, count our days well, live them well, live in light of obedience to God, not ignoring his commands, his precepts. And so what if this morning you and I can learn and have the vision to live life with fewer regrets and more mercies in our lives? I want to exhort you this morning to experience more mercies and fewer regrets. I want to encourage you to see that not only the Lord has provided a great salvation for you and I, but also a great sanctification. The process of making us more like Jesus, thinking more like him, acting more like him. Because when we're in possession of him, that changes us profoundly. I mean, no one has money in the bank. Either you're working or you're saving up and you, you know, you live life without using that money, right? Whether you're hungry and like you got money in the bank, but if you don't use it, what is that good for? That possession doesn't change you. Most people do use that for their necessities. It changes you. That possession changes you the same way the possession of Jesus Christ changes your life naturally. And so the main idea this morning for today's sermon is act now. Act now and seek righteousness for the unrighteous will suffer God's judgment. This morning in our message today, we will find that the day of our action is today. Just as we've seen and encounter this theme of the day of the Lord, the day of our action is today, not tomorrow. Today. You want to live life with fewer regrets? Today is a day of action. Today is a day of determination to make those changes in your life. So act now and seek righteousness, for the unrighteous will suffer God's judgment. So I don't know where your heart may be this morning, but I can assure you as we encounter God's word, you'll have some, he has something for you this morning. So open with me to the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2, and we'll be starting off reading from verses 1 through 3 from the Living, New Living Translation, but I invite you to open up your Bibles or your electronic devices uh, to the translation you have available. And we'll find in the word of God three things. That for better or worse, today is the day to heap up. Today is the day to heap up. We'll see that in the first three verses of Zephaniah 2. Secondly, we'll see today is a day to hear up. Today is a day to hear up. We'll see that in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And then lastly, we'll see that today is also the day to hope up. Today is a day to hope up. Verses 5 through 7 in Zephaniah 3. We've seen now that the prophet has moved his attention back to the people of Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem assumed that everything was well. That they were, you know, keeping up with their church life, with their temple life. Everything was good. Everything was cool. But here was the Lord calling his own people, his own nation a shameful nation, specifically to quote his words. And they were asking, how could he do that when we are his chosen people? I mean, we've received the covenant from Abraham. No other nation has received that. God has rescued us from Egyptian slavery with a strong arm. He brought us through the desert providing for our every need into this promised land. Surely it was all the ungodly nations around them that deserved God's judgment, but not the people of Judah, not, pe- not the people from the southern kingdom of Israel. But when the Lord speaks in this occasion, he had something to say to his people. 
And I want you to catch this because this is why so many Christian people go astray these days and even back then of speaking of the people of God. And the reason why that stems from is because we do not pay attention to the word of God. If we paid attention to the word of God, that would make a profound difference in our lives. People back then as today were prone to listen to other people's ideas or fanciful prophecies from those who claim to speak from the Lord. But naturally, we're, we're not so quick to heed the clear teaching of Scripture. And that leads us into trouble. And so that's why we'll see in the first point this morning too that today is a day of action. Today is the, the day to heap, to act now and seek righteousness because for better or worse, today is the day to heap up. Now you might say, heap up, what's that? Well, heap up is just another word to uh, referring to a large amount or number of something, accumulating something. You rack up points, you know, whether you're, maybe you're a Chick-fil-A uh, a member, right? Every time you go to Chick-fil-A, you scan the, your little card or your, your, the app, right, to get points. You get free stuff, right? You heap up. You're heaping up those points. It's loyalty uh, credits or however you, whatever you use, different stuff. This morning, we're going to talk about a different type of heaping up. Heaping up a large amount of mercies and fewer amount of regrets. Verses 2 to 4, we'll see that the people are accused and the leaders of, of Jerusalem specifically because of their faithfulness and their oppression, their corruption. And in contrast to that unfaithfulness of the people, we'll see God's faithfulness. For better or worse, he's faithful. And his faithfulness will be compared like the sunrise. And the prophet moves his attention back to Jerusalem and addresses these concerns with these words. So let's, let's look at verse 1 with me of chapter 2. This is what the word of God says. Gather together. Yes, gather together, you shameless nation. Gather before judgment begins, before your time to repent is blown away like chaff. The first thing the Lord urges his people is to gather together, right? Notice the repetition, gather together, and then gather together again. And then on verse 2, one more time, gather before judgment begins. Notice the urgency of the matter that the prophet repeats this word. You see, the people had no difficulty understanding why the Lord used this word gather. This was a common word used to heap up the harvest, whether that was wheat, that was barley, or whatever, they accumulated. And then once they accumulated, they then would throw it into the wind or in the air, and the wind would carry off the chaff, and the grain would fall onto the ground, and then they would collect that and store that. So they knew this word. They knew that what was blown away was worthless. Short, short, sharp ends of corn stalks or wheat. And they were always carefully collected and then casted into the fire to be consumed. And so they have this idea clearly in their minds. And so the people of Judah, we have to remember their spiritual condition had been one of contentment. One of unfaithfulness or worshiping false gods. They were doing horrible things like the people around them. They were thinking that they were secure. They're going every weekend to their temple and to worship God. But then in their lives, they were very far away from him. They believed that they would be allowed to carry on living undisturbed by God. Recall chapter 2, uh, chapter 1 specifically those words that he would do either nothing good or bad. So notice there's the second part of verse 2. 
act now before the fierce fury of the Lord falls and the terrible day of the Lord anger begins. We see here in these words of Zephaniah continue again to carry a sense of urgency and sense of, hey, listen up. You're heaping up. Your sinful decisions, your sinful actions, your bad decisions are racking up. And therefore, also bad or sinful consequences of it. But we see here in the midst of that, it seems that there was no hope for them, right? I mean, look at verse three, 2, right? The fierce fury of the Lord falls, and the terrible day of the Lord anger began. And we saw a little bit of what that would look like, right? Chapter 1, we saw that anger falling down, utter destruction. But here, as we may feel that there is no hope for them, we see a call for action. Act now. Today, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, now, today. In other words, if there was to be any hope for them, they needed to act before the appointed time, before the time of judgment. Rather than just being left to themselves, God's judgment would certainly come, and it would arrive at the appointed time. And nothing would be able to hinder or divert its approach. You see, complacency is a disease that was not confined just to Judah in the 7th century, but also to the 21st century, to the people of God in actuality today. We can go into deeper as to why or how they got into this mess. But we see the principle here that we ought to live our lives in a humble gratitude to God for all of his mercies to us. Now, if we don't recall those mercies, it's easy to forget. I mean, frankly, to be honest, I had no idea before today about those 11,000 mercies. I bet you're in a similar spot. You see, when we remember, when we acknowledge, that seeks an opportunity to respond in gratitude, in love, instead of forgetting, instead of thinking that God has not been good to us, that God has not been merciful to us. We see here in the text for the people of Jew that he was holding back his hand of judgment upon this sinful nation. Look with me in verse 3. He goes on to say, Seek the Lord, all who are humble and who follow his commands. Seek to do what is right and to live humbly. Perhaps, even yet, the Lord will protect you. Protect you from his anger on that day of destruction. With such announcements of impending judgment upon the people, we're surprised to read this text. That such sinful people were giving a small glimmer of hope. Notice that word, perhaps, in the text. Perhaps even yet, the Lord will protect you. Why that perhaps? Well, here's the invitation. If they only would act upon this invitation. But at first, a change needed to take place. The people needed to alter their thinking and then their actions. Grow in awareness to then be able to respond in congruency to that gratefulness. You see, the people of Jerusalem had nothing to offer to God to cause him to divert his judgment upon them. Yet, there was one thing, says Sephaniah, they could do. One thing. They could seek 
the Lord, right? Two times in the text is repeated, seek the Lord. Seek to do what is right. But in order to seek, notice how it requires humility. Someone who's seeking acknowledges that, hey, I'm missing something. I need something, right? And seeking requires this level of humility. Those who are proud will see no need to seek the Lord. They will prefer to manage things in their, on their own strength. We're prone to do that. That's human nature. But if the people of Judah, just like us, if we are to have any hope of being sheltered from the day of God's judgment, they needed to seek righteousness and humility. Now, I want you to notice here in the text because two things are happening. One is the impending consequence of their decisions, of their sinful decisions, which will end up in 586 being the destruction of the temple by Babylon. But it's also speaking of a future judgment day as a whole. Just like for us today, our sinful decisions, our actions will lead to sinful or bad consequences as a response to God's judgment on our lives. But at the same time, there is a future day of the Lord, a day of reckoning that is to come. And the the two things needed to seek the Lord, righteousness and humility. These two qualities should be at the center of our lives. These two values should direct our decisions and our actions as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ. To those who had been worrying about how to obtain the necessities of life, you might recall the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 6, right? He tells the people who he was sharing God's word with them. Hey, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? It's righteousness. And everything else will be added unto you. This little word perhaps is one of grace, not a reward. You see, our only hope is to cast ourselves entirely upon the mercy of God. So we live for him knowing that we are utterly depending on his mercy. And we have no claim on him, only on his mercy. Because when we forget this, we begin to go down this route of being ungrateful, of being unconscious of the mercies of God. And we begin to think that we are walking with the Lord, but we're not really seeking him. We're not seeking righteousness and justice as they did for the people of Judah. Let's see how that unfolded for them and how can that be related to our lives. So act now and seek righteousness because today is the day to heap up, to add up. For better or worse, today is the day to also hear up. So on that day of judgment, today is the day to hear and to act. Because on that day, the hearing and the acting will be over. There'll be no more time to do that. So notice with me verse 1 of chapter 3. So we're skipping verse 4. All the, all the way to verse 15 of chapter 2, if you read it, you'll see the sinful consequences of the nations around Israel, particularly Philistia, Ethiopia, and Assyria. But let's jump into back to Jerusalem, to which this prophecy was written, it's speaking to specifically. Look with me, verse 1 of chapter 3. What sorrow awaits rebellious and polluted Jerusalem? The city of violence and crime. Now, I want to point out something here because as English speakers, we will see the word Jerusalem there. But in the Hebrew text, there is no Jerusalem. It's just city. Translators have understood that that city is speaking of Jerusalem. And if you read further down, you'll see why. But in the text here, it's just saying city. What sorrow awaits this rebellious and polluted city, city of violence. 
So no doubt the citizens of Judah were kind of heartened to learn that their God was outraged with these wicked cities around them. Maybe as an older brother might secretly snigger when a younger brother is chastised by the parent. We see this image that's happening here and the people of Israel, specifically in Jerusalem, nodding their heads. Yeah, yeah, they're guilty. Their heads mocking in disapproval when they hear about this city that obeys no one. Look at ver with me verse 2 of chapter 3. No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. When we get to this point, it starts to get a little, a little harsher word. And the people of Judah might, if you notice that phrase, might listen. It's like, what? This people do not trust in the Lord or draw near to this God. They would realize that that is speaking to the people of God, not to the other nations, the pagan nations. This, this is speaking to the people of God. So therefore, these people... We are rebellious. We are polluted. We are a city of violence, of crime. Not Assyria, not the other gods. He's talking to us. So we can imagine the horror that that would be and gradually have dawned upon them as they realized that God was actually speaking about them and their own beloved city of Jerusalem. But let's see how God sees Jerusalem at that time. Look. We saw verse 2. Let's continue verse 3. Its leaders are like roaring lions hunting for, big, for their victims. Its judges are like ravenous wolves at evening time who by dawn have left no trace of their prey. Its prophets are arrogant liars seeking their own gain. Its priests defy the temple by disobeying God's instruction. This verse that we just read, these verses, I, know, I want you to notice four negative clauses that are there describing how this city, how the people of this city failed in its responsibility and its faithfulness to God as the people of the covenant. Notice with me, first thing in verse 2. She listens to no voice. She listens to no one. The second thing, she accepts no correction. Third thing, she does not trust in the Lord. And the fourth thing, she does not draw near to her God. You want to live a life with fewer regrets? If you take these four, two, four things that we see here, if you listen to God's voice, if you accept his correction, if you trust in the Lord your God, if you draw near to the Lord your God, I can assure you, or rather, the scripture assures you and me, we can live a life with fewer regrets and more mercies. This could easily be you and I. And that's why we have to keep a check on our relationship with God. Are we listening to his voice? Are we accepting correction? Do we trust in the Lord our God or do we trust something else? Do we draw near to him? Because it's so easy to fall by the wayside. And so having dealt in general with the people of Jerusalem and the city officials, Sephaniah now turns to the religious leaders. Moses, under the Lord's instructions, had given the people a religious system, leaders, prophets, to urge them to keep God's law priests to preside over their worship and god tells these people that they will also not escape god's condemnation either the message that the lord has for the leaders is as severe as for the leaders you see as we saw in the text the gravity they were this was dangerous because they had been taught to look up to them but these people, these leaders, were not speaking the truth. And so Sephaniah turns to their priests, which their main responsibility is to represent men before God. But yet these priests, by their actions and their attitudes, they had profaned the sanctuary. 
They were living for profit. Their sacrifices in their religious ceremony had been carried out merely as a routine instead of with holy reverence, with meaning. You notice why then it's the importance to focus on the process rather than the product? Because you and I can focus on the product of being good, coming to church, doing all these things, and we can check those things off, but the process of being close to God, drawing close to Him, being open to hear His correction, it takes time. It's not just a one-time thing. It's a continual process of being in connection and relationship with him. If you serve the local body of the church, whether as a staff member, whether as a volunteer, you know, being in leadership of a church and a congregation is a very responsible thing. It's a very noble thing. Church leaders can be a great blessing to God's people, but they can also be a great disaster as these were in the city of Jerusalem in the days of Sephaniah. All church leaders and individual Christian believers, we should make sure that we're always living out the teaching of God's word. And how can we make sure of that? Well, if we listen, if we draw near to him, if we open up God's word, because otherwise we'll be in danger of deceiving ourselves and deceiving God's people. So act now and seek righteousness because today is the day to heap up, to hear up. And for better or for worse, today is the day to hope up. Now, up to this point, it has been a very gloomy message from Zephaniah. But from here on out, the prophet changes its tone. And as we draw close this morning to the message Though that day will be a day of gloom, today can be a day of hope if you act now. For that day can be also a day of hope for you and I. Look with me, verse 5 of chapter 3. But the Lord is still there in the city, and he does no wrong. Day by day, he hands down justice, and he does not fail. But the wicked know no shame. I want you to notice that as we draw close, in spite of that, every time you, he, you see or hear a but in God's scripture, underline that. Pay attention to that. Verse 5, but the Lord is there, still there, in the city. In spite of all unfaithfulness, in spite of all what's going on in the city of Judah, the capital of Judah, Jerusalem, the Lord is still there. Much evil had been done in Jerusalem. We would expect that the Lord would act quickly to remove the city from his presence, wipe it out. Remarkably, instead of doing this, the Lord gently reminds his people of his gracious presence with them, even though they've been so rebellious. And perhaps even Zephaniah is perplexed with this statement. Their powerful God is not hovering outside of the city, waiting to see whether people will amend their ways. No, he's right there, right there in the midst, just as he's always been with his people. Despite terrible disobedience, God tells Jerusalem, I have not deserted you. Wow. How gracious, how merciful is our Lord. Amen. Because of time, we won't, can't go more deeper, but I want you to learn two important lessons from this. First, regardless of our conduct, God does not change his character. Regardless of how we may be acting in our lives, he does not change. He remains faithful, and he invites us graciously into repentance. He might change his actions, but he, not, he won't change his nature. Secondly, He is always there, always has been, and will continue to be righteous. However much he is provoked, he will not do nothing wrong. Don't forget that. As we draw close and as the band comes up, look with me the last couple verses, the second part of verse 5. But the wicked know 
no shame, says the text. I've wiped out many of his actions. Many nations, I'm sorry. Devastating their fortress, walls, and towers. Their streets are now deserted. Their cities lie in silent ruin. There are no survivors, none at all. I thought surely they will have reference for me now, reverence for me now. Surely they will listen to my warnings. Then I won't need to strike again, destroying their homes. But no, they get up early to continue their evil deeds. How unfortunate for the people of Judah that in spite of the Lord being in their midst, they still continue their way. This morning, you want to live life with fewer regrets and more mercies? This is God's advice. Rough advice, tough advice, tough love. But you can be sure you can rack up mercy for the rest of your day. And when that day of judgment comes, you can have the certainty that you will have fewer regrets. Would you please stand? as we respond to him this morning. Father God, we acknowledge through your word, we're open to your correction. We're open, we draw near to you. And as we see our depravity, our wickedness, we also see your great love, your great mercy for us as your people. Would you help us to act now? That today is our day of action before the day of the Lord comes. Would you help us? We respond to you in faith and obedience. In Christ's name. i
Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. Build your solid foundation of the God of hope and love and grace and mercies that are new every day. I will build my life upon your life. It is our fair foundation. I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will build my There's so much happening around the world today, and everyone is seeking hope. As Christ followers, we have the true hope of the gospel, and the Lord invites us into his plan to seek and save the lost and care for his people. Here are a few ways our church is shining Christ's light around the world today and how you can be a part of it. Following the recent natural disasters, our church donated $2,500 to Minuteman Disaster Response for Hurricane Ida relief and $5,000 to Unto Ministries for Earthquake Relief in Haiti. These donations help to provide food, clean water, and shelter for people in desperate need, all in the name of our Savior Jesus. If you'd like to help us respond to crisis and natural disasters around the world, you can give to our Disaster Relief Fund online at stonebriar.org slash giving or write Disaster Relief in the memo of a check or envelope. Our church also supports 25 missionaries around the world who are sharing the gospel and equipping the global church to faithfully teach God's word. You can adopt one of these missionaries, which simply means you'll pray for them regularly and send them encouraging messages or care packages. To get started, stop by our kiosk in the atrium or visit stonebriar.org slash missionaries. And by the grace of God and your faithful generosity, we're able to broadcast our worship services worldwide every Sunday, reaching an average of 7,600 weekly viewers in more than 50 countries. It is our joy to worship the Lord with our online church family and to proclaim His Word to every corner of the earth. Be encouraged, church family. God is in control and He is doing mighty works all around us and through us. 
Explore ways to connect with God and others to find strength and hope in these challenging times at stonebriar.org or stop by one of our information desks today. Good morning, my name is Megan Wall and I'm the pastoral leader of special needs here at Stonebriar Community Church. And we are so thankful that you are here with us today, either in person or online. We are grateful that you chose this morning to become a part of our church family. If this is your first time, I invite you to scan the QR code on the back of the seat to give us a little bit of information so that we can help connect with you and bring you into the body of believers here at Stonebriar. If this is not your first time and you've been here for a while, we invite you to continue your worship through giving or through connecting with us um, in the back of the Connection Center or even on the app. Some of you might not know that Stonebriar has an app and it is a great place for you to give, for you to find different opportunities like those listed in the minute and for you to get information on all the events happening here at Stonebriar. There's even a spot on the app where you can click, I would like prayer. You can just jot down a prayer request and there are people here who will faithfully pray for those requests every single day. So if that's something that you're looking for, please reach out and we would love to pray for you. Let me close our time together in prayer and then you'll be dismissed and we'll see you next week. Lord, we are so thankful that you are in control. We are thankful that you are here every day and that your mercies are new every morning. God, we pray that throughout this week that you would use us as beacons of light in a world that needs to see the hope of Jesus Christ. May you use us in ways in our community and our family and bring us back here together to worship together next Sunday. We love you and praise you for what you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.